Um, well, the way to understand uh, Zeno's paradoxes, or at least understand what he's doing with his paradoxes, is uh, probably you first have to understand the position of Parmenides, his teacher, who he's uh, defending. So he's defending his teacher Parmenides' position. So Zeno, Zeno is a pupil of Parmenides. And uh, in, in Plato's dialogue to Parmenides, Zeno and Parmenides both travel to Athens to have a discussion with young Socrates. And actually, uh, it's one of the few uh, one of the few times in the dialogues in which you know, Socrates doesn't get the better of his opponent, but his opponent gets the better of him. So young Socrates actually gets kind of examined and gets put in kind of self-contradictions, which is usually what Socrates does to other people later on in his life. So both you can see that Plato thinks that in a way Socrates is emulating Parmenides and maybe even Zeno, and also that uh, Plato respects uh, Parmenides enough to uh, portray him in the dialogues that way. Whether or not that is, happened historically, it probably didn't. But that, that kind of gives you an idea of who uh, the sort of mind that Parmenides was. Now, Parmenides' big position was that uh, it, the, he insisted that the, it is impossible that being become non-being or vice versa. So uh, it's in a way, it's in a way a version of the principle of non-contradiction. So Parmenides may, you could argue, is the first person to see that the principle of non-contradiction is fundamental to human thought. Being cannot be non-being. But you have philosophers like Heraclitus who say, uh, you know, is, because there's change and change is obvious, then day becomes night. Uh, the young become the old, and one opposite becomes the other opposite. So it seems that something becomes something else, it comes to be it, therefore the day comes to be night, or the day is night, and the young comes to be old, so the day, uh, the young is old, and so on and so forth. So it seems like uh, motion does imply that being can become non-being and therefore be non-being. And so what Parmenides' reaction to that is to deny that there is motion. He, he, what he, he thinks motion is a mirage. So it's an appearance. We all, uh, motion appears to us, uh, but appearances can be deceiving. There's nothing real behind the motion. All there really is is being, and being doesn't change. It never changes into non-being. It always is itself. It cannot not be. Uh, so uh, therefore, you can imagine if you, if you held this position, then, uh, then you'd receive a lot of ridicule. So if you're denying change, there's nothing as obvious as change. So a uh, line in Shakespeare is, uh, motion sooner catches the eye than what not stirs. Motion is obvious. And if you, if you, don't, if you deny that motion exists, then you're obviously going to get a lot of ridicule. So Zeno's teacher received a lot of ridicule, and his pupil, who respected his teacher, wanted to defend his teacher from this ridicule. So he came up with these paradoxes. And what the par how the paradoxes work is, if you assume motion exists, then you get into contradictions. Uh, and so there's four different paradoxes, at least according to Aristotle in his physics. I'll just go over two that I think are the most interesting ones. Uh, the first one is, is called the arrow. It's, um, it's, you, you're supposed to conceive of you know, someone shooting an arrow from a bow and reaching its target. And you have to think about the area in every moment of its motion. And if you just take the arrow, arrow in one now of its motion, you say, does the arrow move in the present? So you're watching the arrow fly by and you say, right this moment is the arrow moving. And you have to say it doesn't move because if you say in the now it moved, there was a before and then there was an after because motion implies a before and after. But that would be a bef but in the before that would be past and in the after it would be future because the before and after in time is past and future. But of course the now is what is neither past nor future. So there cannot be motion in the now. It's, it's contradictory. Uh, but in the past, all you had in the past were nows. And so in those nows, the arrow wasn't moving. All you have in the future will be nows. 
And in those nows, the arrow won't be moving. So at no time will the arrow be moving because at no, every now, the arrow can't move. So you say, uh, you say that you, if you assume that motion exists, you assume that the movement of the arrow happens when at no time it happens, which of course is a contradiction. So Parmenides would say, you can't say that. You have to deny motion exists. The other kind of more famous one is, um, it's called the Achilles. And you, you just have to conceive of, uh, you have Achilles, we'll, we'll uh, draw him as A, and you have the tortoise T. And of course, Achilles is swift-footed, so he runs faster than the tortoise. And they're in a race. Uh, and the tortoise gets a head start uh, because obviously Achilles is faster. And uh, by the, so once the tortoise gets to here, we'll call it point sub one, Achilles starts going. And by the time Achilles uh, gets to point one, the tortoise will have actually moved a little farther, right? So he'll be here at point two. And so we'll say, okay, well, after Achilles gets to point one, he has to get to point two. So he gets to point two. But in the time it took Achilles to get from one to two, the tortoise has gone a little further to point three. And then Achilles has to go from two to three and get there. Uh, the problem is uh, you can do this forever, and Achilles never catches the tortoise because the tortoise will always be a little bit farther ahead than Achilles. And you can do this as many times as you like. The Achilles will get as close as, as you want to the tortoise, but Achilles will never catch the tortoise, which is, of course, absurd because that's not what appears to us. And so uh, what appears to us obviously must be a mirage. At least that's the position. Um, and there you go, that's Zeno's paradoxes. Oh, really? No, I'm curious. How, how do you solve that paradox right there? Um, well, maybe, maybe you can't. <laughs> I know. So if, if, well, let's say this. If motion exists, maybe it only barely exists. Is that right? Barely exists? It barely exists. Okay, what that's what Aristotle yeah. says. Motion barely exists. Yeah, he says if motion, motion exists, but if it exists, it barely exists. Okay. Uh, we'll have to make another video on that one. Okay, <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll make another video. Yeah, okay. Thank you.